Okay. Uh, just again to confirm. Uh, hopefully, all of you can hear me. Uh, and uh, this is a pointer to the left of the screen. Can you see it? Hello. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. This is the top of the screen near code. Yes, so can you see it? Uh, on the right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of lectures, uh, we have started uh, about this process of translation, uh, which is uh, how uh, the message which has been transcribed from DNA onto uh, the form which is called as RNA uh, is uh, finally converted by the process of translation into what are called as amino acids. Okay, uh, uh, and uh, in the last lecture, we talked about uh, one aspect of how this process uh, uh, can potentially occur by looking at uh, the concept of what is called as a genetic code. Okay where we concentrated uh, actually on the, uh, if I can use this picture, on this RNA part, okay? And we talked about this uh, mRNA in terms of what are its properties and what are the features of mRNA uh, which play a role in how finally uh, that message in the form of uh, nucleic acid bases is converted to the protein, okay? And we uh, talked about uh, what are called as uh, genetic code, uh, how it was discovered, uh, that the fact that it is uh, read at, as three nucleotides at one time, which are called as codons, and uh, we start, talked about start codon, stop codon, how different three base combinations uh, read uh, at, uh, three at one time, uh, give potentially 64 combinations, uh, and to code for 20 amino acids. And we talked about things like degeneracy of the code, how the code is uh, almost uh, universal except for few species which use the code slightly differently and so on and so forth okay and we ended uh, by you know kind of a, you know saying uh, paying a tribute uh, or uh, appreciating the people who allowed us to understand how codons uh, in biological systems are used uh, in the process of translation and the three people we talked about uh, uh, who, who won a Nobel Prize for this work was uh, Nirenberg, uh, Holly, and uh, Dr. Khoran. Okay? Uh, and uh, look at uh, they got the uh, prize in 68 for physiology and medicine for interpretation of the genetic code and its function in protein uh, synthesis. Okay? And uh, we ended with this slide where we talked about uh, uh, Hargobin Khorana and uh, who was actually born uh, in what is called as old India, uh, which was a combination of India and Pakistan at that time. And uh, from there he moved to the US where he did most of his contributions. Okay, uh, and, uh, and the fact that not only did he win the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for physiology, he was one of the people who first actually suggested the idea of polymerase chain reaction. So going a little further from where we stopped last time, uh, today we'll uh, talk about uh, this portion here. Okay, uh, uh, the adapter which actually is going to connect uh, your mRNA and your amino acid. Okay, so the idea of uh, this adapter uh, came about uh, because somebody thought that there is uh, a need to bring together the amino acid in the correct order corresponding to the codon sequence specified of the RNA. Okay, and since the amino acid itself has got nothing uh, which will uh, allow it to kind of, uh, you know, sync with the nucleotide base sequence on the mRNA, it was thought that they needed an adapter molecules. Okay. Uh, the other part is amino groups and carboxy groups uh, do not uh, readily form what are called as peptide bonds. Okay. Uh, here it says hydrogen bonds, but more correctly it should be peptide bonds. Okay, and for this uh, reaction to occur, where you fuse an amino group to a carboxy group with the elimination of water, generally requires uh, to you to activate the functional groups. Okay, 
and most of the time we want to activate the carboxyl group uh, and make it such that the OH becomes a good leaving group and therefore when amino group attacks the carbon to carbon, uh, the peptide bond formation is uh, uh, favored. Okay? Now, both of these functions, which is uh, bringing together the amino acid in the correct order, corresponding to the codon sequence on the mRNA and uh, uh, the, the fact of uh, you know activating the amino acid so that it can uh, uh, and conveniently form peptide bond. Both these functions are done by amino acid uh, tRNA or why should say tRNA. So we are going to look at uh, tRNA which are these uh, uh, adapter molecules. Okay. Now we already have looked at tRNA a little bit. Okay, and uh, I'm going to visit the structure of tRNA again. Okay, so this is typically how a tRNA looks uh, in what is called as two-dimensional representation. Okay, uh, in uh, biological systems, uh, the tRNAs which are present, uh, uh, and there is a variety of them in a given cell at any given time. Uh, uh, they have lengths anywhere from around uh, uh, 72 to 73 nucleotides uh, to about say 93 to 95. Okay, so as you go from this five prime end, and each of this dot representing a nucleotide, if you were to go all the way from the five prime end to the three prime end, you would find that there will be about uh, 70 to 72 to around 93 to 95 uh, nucleotides attached to the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay. The bases which are generally present because it is RNA is A, U, G, N, C. That is adenine, uh, uracil, guanine and uh, okay. But tRNA is also known uh, for some unusual uh, structural features. Okay. First and foremost, let me talk you through the general structure. Okay. If you look at uh, tRNA, uh, it is said to have uh, in fact, like you know, five features. Okay, one is called as the uh, D arm. If I start from here, and the D arm is so called because it contains two or three what is called the D residues, and D stands for uh, dihydrouridine. Okay, so uh, in this uh, section, you will find typically uh, three or four, as I say, or two or three uridines which have been reduced. Okay, so if you normally if you look, remember the structure of uridine, no? it has got, uh, if I were to start from nitrogen 1, it is NH, then C double bond O as I go uh, clockwise, then again NH, then again C double bond O, and then two carbons which have got a double bond between them, and the carbon number 6 that is attached again back to the nitrogen. Okay, So, uh, if I were to draw it in a pointer here, so NH, C double bond O, NH, C double bond O, then CH double bond CH and back to the nitrogen. Now this double bond here, when you reduce it, you get dihydrouridine and two or three of these dihydrouridines are present in this region. That's why it is called as a DR. Then going further, the next uh, structural feature is what you call as the anticodon arm or anticodon loop. Okay. It is in this uh, region uh, that you find that there are three bases which have got the correct sequence relative to the sequence which is present in mRNA such that uh, the sequences are complementary to each other. Okay, And uh, when this complementary sequences uh, bind to each other, then the message which is present in the mRNA is actually in a sense, uh, uh, you know, uh, linked to the amino acid which is being carried somewhere here. Okay. Now, since each tRNA has got a different set of nucleotides in this group, it is said that each tRNA and therefore codes for a very specific amino acid. Okay, just to give an example, let us say I have a sequence on mRNA which is AUG, okay, going from 5 prime to 3 prime and AUNG. The tRNA will come and bind in the exact opposite fashion. Okay, again, see this orientation is 5 to 5 to 3, so it will actually turn around. So that it becomes 5 to 3 in this direction. Okay. Now this is A U G. So where A is present on the tRNA will be present U. Where it is U, there will be A. Where there is a G, there will be a C. 
and then this the rna which has this correct uh, you know complementary sequence with aug will also be the trna which will be carrying either methionine or formal methionine and that's how the linking between the amino acid and the codon on the mrna is accomplished by this molecule which is called as trna okay the third is what is called as an extra or variable arm uh, and uh, this can be very short or kind of long depending on the rna we are talking about okay but other than that uh, no special feature other than it is there and it present at different lengths then going further we have what is called the t psi c loop okay and here t stands for the fact that this thymidine which is normally never seen in rna is seen in this uh, region here and pseudo uridine is uh, a very unusual uh, nucleotide where the uridine uh, rather than being attached via nitrogen 1 or 2 uh, ribose uh, carbon 1 uh, is attached through a, the 5 prime carbon of the uracil to the 1 carbon of the uh, sugar okay and because this unique connect connection it is referred to as pseudo uridine okay and generally you always find that uh, this sequence thymidine pseudo uridine and uh, cytidine are present one after the other that's why it is referred to as a t psi and c loop or t psi and c r okay so again first feature d arm second feature anti codon arm third is this extra r fourth is a t psi c m and the last is what you call as amino acid r so uh, every t rna uh, although it might be differing in all of these regions related to each other always in the end as a cca conserved sequence okay and it is to this a that is attached the amino acid uh, in what is referred to as a activated t rna okay so t rna is present in two forms one which is called as unloaded form which is shown here or native form which is shown here and the second is activated form where the amino acid will be linked to this uh, adenine which is present at the 3 prime and that is referred to as activated trna or amino acid loaded trna okay so uh, shown here is a uh, uh, A specific example of a yeast tRNA, and uh, again look at it. This is called the D loop. You can see the two dihydrouridine. This is the T psi loop. Uh, this is the uh, extra loop where also there is another pseudo uridine present. Then there is the anti codon loop, which very interestingly has uh, uh, inosine here. Okay, uh, which is uh, another variant of a nucleotide. and note it ends at cca okay now one of the important steps uh, in the synthesis of proteins uh, from mrna is the activation of trna or what is called as loading of the trna uh, with the correct amino acid okay uh, and this uh, function of loading the correct amino acid on the correct trna is run by a group of enzymes which are called as uh, 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 acyl amino uh, amino acyl trna synthetase okay what they do is they use atp and the hydrolysis of atp to link an amino acid to the correct trna to give you what is called as amino acyl trna and that's why the name of the enzyme amino acyl trna synthetases and the reason they are called synthetases is in the reaction atp gets hydrolyzed uh, but the phosphate doesn't get transferred uh, to the substrate or anything okay it is just the, uh, the energy uh, in the hydrolysis of the high energy phosphate bond is used to drive the reaction okay now how does this uh, activation of trna occur by this enzyme called as uh, amino acyl trna synthetase okay uh, the steps are shown here okay now what happens typically is uh, when the correct trna and the associated amino acid come together in the active site of the correct amino acyl trna synthetase what happens is atp 
is used to convert the amino acid to what is referred to as a activated amino acid by loading it onto tRNA to give you amino acid tRNA. In the process, ATP is broken down to AMP plus two inorganic phosphates, which will again break down to two phosphates and drive this reaction. Overall, uh, this reaction has a negative delta G of minus 29 kilojoules per mole, making it fairly favorable. Okay, but if you look at the individual steps that occur in the active site, the first thing that happens is the given amino acid. Okay. Uh, let us say for argument, uh, this is a tRNA which is carrying say glycine, okay, uh, and therefore uh, the amino acid which will uh, be tagged on to this will be glycine, and there R will be equal to H, okay. So presume that this is glycine, and in the first step in the active site, uh, glycine interacts with ATP, and see what happens. This uh, uh, oxygen. Uh, which is in the ionized form in the body, uh, the minus uh, charge or the electrons or the oxygen attack this uh, phosphate, okay, which is called the alpha phosphate group. Okay, this is a CH2 group. Related to this, this is alpha phosphate, beta phosphate, and gamma phosphate. So it attacks the alpha phosphate and releases these two pyrophosphates, okay, as PPI. Now PPI gets further hydrolyzed to two inorganic phosphates. That makes this reaction thermodynamically very feasible. And what happens at the end of the uh, day? Uh, the ADP, AMP is the one to which is attached the amino acid. Okay, so this is referred to as pi prime amino acyl adenylate. Pi prime amino acyl adenylate. Okay, because this is adenine. Okay. Now at this point, what has happened is. The amino acid has been hooked up to what is called as uh, AMP. Now in the next step, and uh, this can occur in two ways. Okay, uh, this uh, amino acid is transferred to the A of tRNA. Remember, in tRNA, the last one is CCA, and that is shown here. So if this is C, then there is a uh, uh, what do you call as three prime to five prime phosphate bond to the next. Uh, uh, ribose. This is carbon uh, five of the ribose, then four uh, of the ribose, three, two, and one of ribose. So what happens is this uh, oxygen, which is lone pair at the two position, attacks this carbonyl carbon. It eliminates AMP. Okay, so in essence, what you have done is here you have actually made carboxyl group contain uh, have a good leaving group in the form of AMP. So that you can link this oxygen to the uh, carbonyl carbon. Okay. Now, uh, again, this because it's a good leaving group, this is Sir, you are not audible. Hello, sir. You are aren't audible. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, start sharing again. Okay. 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 Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Hello. 
Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so as I was saying, uh, after the first step, that is uh, the reaction of the uh, carboxylic acid group of amino acid with ATP, such that uh, you form a uh, kind of like an anhydride linkage where oxygen links with phosphate and removes pyrophosphate. Uh, this entity, which is actually nothing but actually activated amino acid, is attached to the sugar. And uh, in one of the type of uh, amino acid tRNA synthetases, which are called as class 1 synthetases, the 2 prime oxygen uh, attacks the carbonyl carbon, eliminates AMP, and in that process, now this amino acid is attached to the adenine of the RNA. Okay, that is a terminal adenine via the 2 prime uh, oxygen. Now, in the next step, what happens is uh, this uh, is transferred to the 3 prime oxygen to finally give you the amino acid TI. Then you have uh, CH3 connection. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Me, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes. So finally, what do you get is uh, CCA, where to the A here is attached the amino acid. Okay, so this is what uh, happens in class 1 uh, tRNA synthesis. Okay? Now, in uh, relation to this, in the class 2 uh, tRNA synthetases, the process is more straightforward. Uh, directly, uh, the oxygen, which is of the 3 prime uh, uh, OH group, attacks this carbonyl carbon, eliminates the AMP, and the amino acid gets loaded onto the adenine. Okay? So, uh, the, the, the only difference between type 1 and type 2 is that in the second step, uh, how the connection occurs. So, in type 1, the connection is first to the 2 prime oxygen, and then that amino acid is transferred to the 3 prime oxygen, while in class 2, uh, this intermediate step is avoided and you get a direct connection uh, of the amino acid to the 3 prime oxygen of the uh, adenine of the terminal uh, base of the tRNA. Okay. So, uh, finally, uh, it looks somewhat like this. So, if this is the native uh, tRNA general structure. In the end, it is CCA. When this is loaded with an amino acid, what will happen is to this adenine here, to the 3 prime position will be attached this amino acid as an amino acid group. Okay. And uh, the nomenclature of uh, the tRNA, you know, is different when you are talking about the unloaded one versus the loaded one. So, for example, uh, this is a tRNA uh, for alanine. Okay. And uh, if I want to talk about this tRNA, I'll write it like this tRNA with a subscript ala. Okay. And when I write it like that, it tells me that it's a basic tRNA without any amino acid. But this tRNA is designed to what they call as carry alanine. But when it is actually loaded with alanine, that is, it is activated and it is in the form of amino acyl tRNA, then the same entity is renamed as ala tRNA ala. Okay. Or sometimes you write it as alanyl tRNA ala, which tells me that this tRNA which is supposed to carry alanine actually has alanine. So, it is now a activated tRNA or a loaded tRNA. And where has the loading occurred? Again at the 3 prime. Now, if you think very carefully, now actually this tRNA itself with this oxygen here is actually a good Lewy group. Okay. So, you have actually now Again, an activated carboxylic acid group ready for peptide bond formation with another amino acid. Okay, so that's why we call as uh, this as the activated tRNA or activated amino acid tRNA. So now remember, one of the, uh, we said that tRNA does two things at one shot. Uh, it uh, it reads the message on the mRNA via the anticodon loop. At the same time. It brings in the correct amino acid so that they can link it correctly. Okay. So it acts as a perfect adapter. And not only that, it carries the amino acid in a ready to react form, what is called the activated carboxylic acid form. 
Now in our body, or in almost all biological systems, you will find that uh, uh, there are several uh, tRNA synthetases, and all of them uh, use ATP and its hydrolysis to load the amino acid. Now, since there are 20 amino acids, you'll find that most biological systems have a minimum of 22 amino acid tRNA synthetases. But because of degeneracy of the code and because of wobble hypothesis, uh, in many organisms, you'll find more than 20 amino acid tRNA synthetases. Uh, generally, we are talking in 32 minimum or even more than that. Okay, And all these reactions require magnesium. Okay, for activating it. So, just to give an idea of how this uh, uh, amino acid tRNA synthetases look, okay, uh, this is the, the structure of the type 1, okay, and uh, this is the actual enzyme. If you see this, uh, this is the uh, tRNA, and uh, if you look at it uh, in this red here, if you can see, okay, uh, that is the ATP, okay. So bound ATP red pinpoints the active site near the end of the amino acid R. Okay, and look at this one here. This is the type two. Here again we have a tRNA bound, and you can see if you look very closely uh, the ATP which is present. Okay, uh, so the difference between uh, this one, this one is uh, this can do actually it has got two active sites. Okay, so it can do uh, two loadings at one time. Okay, but again. The mechanism is slightly different, direct addition to the 3 prime OH group. Okay. Now, a uh, lot of time people uh, do not give uh, this tRNA synthesis the adequate respect it deserves or the adequate appreciation it deserves. Okay. One of the things you should realize is when protein translation is occurring, okay, where the mRNA is being read and the amino acids are joined together. Uh, by different tRNAs bringing different amino acids and sitting on the mRNA uh, and all, all of this is catalyzed by a ribosome. At that time, the ribosome doesn't do proof check to see whether the correct tRNA has come and it has been rolled correctly with the correct amino acid. Okay. So if I want protein synthesis to occur without any fault, and make sure that the correct amino acid is carried by the correct TRD, that job of confirming whether things are all going correct is actually with the synthetases. So these synthetases are actually said to be a, a second type of genetic code. Because if you, if you think of synthetases, no, they have to do, do two things. They have to make sure that the correct tRNA comes into their active site, and the correct amino acid also comes into that active site, and they are both connected correctly. Okay, so in the active site of the very specific tRNA synthetase, there are points where there is recognition for the anticodon part of the tRNA, and there is also a recognition site for the correct amino acid, and such that they will get linked correctly to the uh, adenine at the three prime end. Okay, so these tRNA synthetases do a very important job in the protein synthesis in that uh, they are the ones which make sure things happen in an error free fashion okay now uh, going further uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the wobble hypothesis how uh, different uh, codons can be recognized by the same tRNA and uh, the correct amino acid uh, will be loaded uh, uh, as part of the growing peptide chain uh, this is uh, what you find when you look at all the tRNA. Okay, so there are certain rules which allow for the correct uh, uh, interaction between the tRNA and the mRNA codon, and indirectly the correct amino acid coming in. Okay, so uh, what I've shown here is an mRNA in the five prime to three prime orientation. Okay, and here is one codon which is AUC. As it is read in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay. Now interacting with uh, this codon is this uh, tRNA, and I've written the tRNA in the opposite orientation. So if you notice now, no, five prime end is here. This is your D arm. This is the anticodon. 
this is the extra arm this is t psi c loop and this is where the ammonia acid will be carried okay so till now i was always writing it the other way for the first time i have written it correctly uh, relative to the mrna okay so in this anti codon loop if you were to think uh, if uh, this i can call 1 2 3 in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction as a codon for a given amino acid complementary to that in the 5 prime to 3 di direction again call calling it 1 2 3 would be uh, g a n u which will base pair with a u c and this this base pairing which allows the correct amino acid to come as the peptide chain is being formed okay now this is what is uh, observed okay now uh, uh, pay attention for a little while okay now if at the as i say the one position of the anti codon okay here it is g if it is c or a okay then that trn which has got a c or an a at position 1 of its anti codon group will only recognize one specific codon on the mrna and that codon will have a g at the 3 prime end that is here what is c it should be a g okay and then that uh, trna which carries a a will always recognize a u in the mrna in the corresponding position okay the other two positions here always will have complementary uh, basis so if it's a y it will be a x it's a y it will be x and this will always be uh, what do you call as uh, the correct base pairing that is if it is g it will be a c if it's a c it will be a g and so on and so forth okay but what is what to notice is that if if a trna has got c or a at position 1 of its anti codon loop then it will only recognize one codon of the mrna okay so to give an example if the codon uh, anti codon loop uh, contains c y x that is c y x then that trna would always recognize y x and g and no other sequence on the mrna okay now look at uh, the other situation if a trna carries either a u here or a g here okay then what is observed is that that trna is able to recognize any of the corresponding opposite bases in the mrna okay for example if you remember u is a pyrimidine base so this uh, uh, trna which contains uracil here which is a pyrimidine can recognize mrna sequences which have got either a or g here that means either of the purines okay now remember at this other two positions the pairing has to be perfect uh, we are only talking about the last co you know last base of the mrna okay which means uh, that if for example here in this case uh, this had been u okay if this had been uh, or, or let us take an example that it is g right then this trna would recognize auc and it also recognize auu because of this property <coughs> and that allows degenerate codes to be read by the same trna that means now what four different codons can be recognized by two different trna okay so i do not need to have four different trns because it is yya yyg okay if i simply carry xyu i should be able to recognize both the codons and even more interesting is if at this one position there is a inosine and inosine is a, a unusual base uh, uh, it is like a if i can use the word uh, kind of a half uracil where there is only one oxygen okay uh, when inosine is present at this position then that inosine is able to base pair with adenine or uracil or cytosine okay so now remember inosine itself is a, a variant of a purine base okay. okay so 
it is able to not only recognize pyrimidines, but it also is able to recognize other purines. Okay, so it's very odd, uh, but that is what is observed. So which means now that uh, a tRNA which carries uh, I here, okay, and any two bases here can potentially recognize three different codons. Okay, uh, to give an example, if this had been U, A, and I, or as it is shown here, if it were C, G, and I, then this uh, tRNA would recognize on the mRNA C, G, A, C, G, U, or C, G, C. Okay, which means three different codons will be recognized by the same tRNA. Okay, and uh, that is what we refer to as a wobble hypothesis that uh, the degenerate codons which are present are recognized by tRNA by uh, by correctly designing the tRNA to have the correct base at the one position. So, so those uh, amino acids where there are uh, degenerate codons, they tend to have tRNAs which uh, carry a inosine here, which will recognize all those different uh, codons. Okay, so uh, so so to to summarize. When all the bases here and all the bases in the codon are exactly complementary, it is called as perfect pairing. But when usually two bases are correct, but a third one they pair differently, then that is called as wobble pairing. Okay, so that is how tRNAs are able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, be as a buffer between the amino acid and the mRNA sequence. Okay, and they correctly bring the amino acids so that peptide bond can be formed in sync with what is dictated by the sequence on the mRNA. Now, where does this actually occur? Okay, where does uh, uh, all of this occur? That is mRNA, tRNA, amino acid all coming together. It occurs on what are referred to as uh, ribosomes. And ribosomes, uh, uh, many scientists uh, uh, you know, uh, talk about them as giant RNA enzymes. Okay, and they are and they are really huge. This is their complex supramolecular assemblies or complex supramolecular machines. Okay, just to give an idea, uh, in general, a ribosome has 65% of its content as RNA, and only 35% of its content as protein. Okay, so uh, correctly speaking, uh, you know, it is called as a, uh, uh, it should be called as, you know, a proteonucleide, but uh, for some reason it is called as ribonucleoprotein. Because in this terminology, when we, uh, when you use terminologies like this, for example, when you say uh, glycoprotein, we also always say protein is the larger part, glyco is the smaller part. Or when you say proteoglycan, that means protein is a smaller part and glycan is a bigger part. So when you first read it like this, ribonucleoprotein, you get a feeling that ribonucleo part is a lesser part and protein is a larger part, but it is not so. Okay, this is an incorrect nomenclature. In fact, RNA content is more than protein content, but for some reason it is called as ribonucleoprotein. Okay, now in uh, what are called as prokaryotes, you already know this. So what we call as a 30S ribosomal subunit and a 50S ribosomal subunit, which are uh, collectively called small ribosomal subunit and large ribosomal subunit, come together to form what is called a functional 70S unit on which uh, this uh, procedure of amino acid joining to give you peptide based on the sequence of mRNA actually occurs. Okay, uh, typically you will find about 50,000 such ribosomes are present in a cell and they are fairly big. They are 18 nanometer in size and when cell division is occurring actively, they might be as high as 25 to 30 percent of the dry weight of the cell. And they are huge entities because the molecular weight of these ribosomes is close to 2.7 million. Okay, and now, uh, and as I said earlier, if you look at the roles of the RNA and the protein in these ribosomes, you find that the functional importance of RNA supersedes that of the protein. So, in fact, uh, 
RNA is the driver and protein is the uh, passenger in this. Okay. Now the reason they, they call these as RNA enzymes is that when you look closely, when you look at the X-ray structures of these ribosomes, and uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with this, uh, much of the work on doing the X-ray structure of uh, ribosomes was done by a gentleman called uh, uh, Venki, okay, or Venkatraman. Okay. Uh, you can look it up. Okay, he has uh, also got. I think it's, I think he got a Nobel Prize for that also. Okay, and uh, he found that when you look at the X-ray structure, and when you look at the place where actually uh, peptide bond formation occurs, the only thing you find in that region is RNA, and there is no protein within close to about 20 angstroms. Okay, 20 angstroms is around uh, uh, two nanometers of the place where peptide bond formation occurs. That means no proteins are playing a role in catalyzing the peptide bond formation. This is actually assisted by the RNA. And that's why uh, these uh, ribosomes are referred to as uh, giant RNA enzymes or ribozymes. Okay. So uh, this is uh, what I just uh, talked about here. Uh, in a prokaryote, uh, what you find is a 30s sub, subunit which contains uh, uh, 21 different proteins uh, and RNA come together to give uh, what is called as uh, the small subunit. Uh, and the RNA which is present is called as 16s RNA in this uh, entity. And the 15s, 50s subunit of the ribosome or called what is called as a large subunit. There are 33 different proteins, uh, some of them uh, are in two or three copies and therefore the total number of proteins is 36 and they and two pieces of RNA which are called as a 5S and 23S ribosomal RNA they come together to give you this uh, big entity which is called a 50S entity. Okay. Now uh, how do these RNAs look? Okay, Here is the structure of the uh, 5S RNA which is present in uh, uh, this uh, ribosome. Uh, this is how 16S RNA looks. So you can see there are a lot of these uh, what are called hairpin loops which are present at different points along the 16S RNA. And this is how the 23S RNA looks. Okay? And again, uh, what this is telling you is uh, it's a big loop, but there are regions where there is no base pairing. So you see a uh, you know, a circular structure. And here is like a char rasta or sat rasta. Everywhere here is a hairpin loop. And finally, uh, uh, and that itself is attached to this other entity. Collectively, they are what is called as a 23S uh, RNA. Now, if you were to look at uh, how they and the proteins come together in the ribosome, uh, here is the structure. Okay, so this is how the 30S subunit looks. Okay, and uh, uh, and this is how the 50S subunit looks. Okay, now. Uh, what what is shown here is that uh, all of these uh, parts, okay, where uh, you see this, you know, worm-like structures and the non-worm-like structures. Uh, the worm-like structures are all protein components, okay, and the non-worm-like components are all RNA components. So that is what it is telling. You. RNA uh, occupies more space and is probably more important than the protein part. And what is shown here in this yellow marked A, P, and E are, if you remember from your 11th and 12th, the A site of ribosomes, the P site of ribosomes, and the E site of ribosomes. Okay. And when they both come together, the 50S and 30S, uh, what you find is this uh, structure here. Okay. And this is where the RNA will pass through, what you call the mRNA will pass through as the message is being read to give you the uh, uh, you know, correct uh, uh, amino acids uh, which are linked one, one, one to the other. Okay, uh, This is another view of the same thing. Again, this is how the mRNA will uh, go inside or, or I can use the other word. This is how the ribosome will move along the mRNA reading three bases at a time and this is the active site where amino acid tRNA sets forms a, uh, what do you call, and it interacts with the uh, ribosome and, 
and and as the mrna comes in and the trna sex here uh, very systematically uh, different amino acids are brought in and joined together okay uh, so if you look at uh, the next part uh, just to uh, compare bacterial with the eukaryotic if you remember we said that in the bacteria uh, 30s which is a smaller subunit and 50s which is a larger subunit come together to form as the functional 70s ribosome uh, in eukaryote something very similar happens the difference is that the smaller subunit uh, has got a density of 40 sedimentary unit or sedimentation coefficient the larger subunit is also slightly larger it is 60s and when they come together you get what is called the ats uh, uh, functional uh, ribosome on which all the protein synthesis occur okay now uh, the other interesting part is that uh, the way they discovered uh, that uh, these ribosomes are the place where uh, you know all the things happen is uh, they did a very nice experiment okay uh, they took uh, a long sequence of nucleotides which was say either u or either a or either c and this represented what you call as a mrna okay when they took this sequence of extended us extended a and extended c which represents mrna and to that they added ribosomes and all the amino acid trnas they found that something very specific happened when this mrna was presented to the ribosomes the only trna which entered the ribosomes was a phenyl trna that means the trna which carried activated phenyl alanine okay so this means that there is some sort of linkage between the base which is seen in the mrna the ribosome itself which allows this Uh, uh, mRNA to sit in the active site, and which tRNA is allowed to come into the active site when this mRNA is sitting. Okay, and likewise, they also observed that when ribosomes were given mRNA which was all A, then the only tRNA whose binding to the ribosome was more than usual was that of lyse uh, uh, of lysyl tRNA, because AAA actually codes for lysine. and that came in to a much greater extent than any other trna so which means the ribosome is also giving a correct environment for the sequence of mrna to be read and the correct trna to be recruited it responds to the codon sequence which is present okay so which so we now know that all of the, the things are you know beautifully designed so that they work with each other one the mrna which is carrying the code for which amino acid needs to join together the trna which correctly carries the correct amino acid based on the anti codon loop which itself has and the ribosome which allows all of these things to come correctly okay uh, uh, with respect to each other rather than any trna coming irrespective of any code which is present on the mrna now now that we know that these things function very correctly we can actually start looking at how as protein synthesis actually occurs and this occurs again in the same manner as you have seen in any other things happen there is initiation elongation termination and then a release okay but uh, we will look at this uh, next time okay so i'm going to stop here uh, and i'm going to kind of uh, go back uh, to that uh, our scene and uh, let me see if there are any uh, questions okay so please remember uh, there is no power here so i am on a hot spot so i hope uh, uh, everything has come here okay so i'm just going to download the attendance list uh, let me see if there is anything in the chat okay huh? okay uh, i hope you can hear me uh, everyone yes, can hear sir. me yes sir yeah okay uh, so Uh, any questions uh, uh, i don't see anything sir, in the chat sir i had a uh, question yeah i had yeah. a question okay. so i still don't get the link like how the trna 
it identifies the um, codon um, the opposite uh, codon from the mrna uh-huh. i get it but uh-huh. how does it identify the amino acid like there is send out some signal or something like that to the amino acid to bind to no no the... no no see that function of loading the correct amino acid is not the function of the trna itself it's the function of the trna synthetase okay uh, the amino acid loading that occurs on the trna is catalyzed by the enzyme trna synthetase okay and this trna synthetase is actually the key player who is able to bind the trna and in such a fashion that uh, 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 that there is recognition of what is the anti codon sequence on the trna with respect to the active site of the synthetase and that synthetase which can allow the correct trna only to bind at that site will also carry the correct amino acid in the loading site okay so uh, that job as you are saying of uh, how will the trna bring the correct amino acid and load it onto itself that loading is not done by the trna the loading is actually done by trna synthetase okay so you can but imagine it, what uh, uh, yeah hello but how does the synthetase identify that this is the correct amino acid with respect okay. to the uh, codon anticodon so uh, okay uh, so so imagine now uh, Uh, and i'll tell you how the synthetase uh, may be looking okay uh, let us say the synthetase has got uh, uh, you know t- uh, two uh, arms okay uh, if you have uh, in your case no uh, your left uh, palm and your right palm okay now on the left palm imagine there is a cavity which is circular okay and on the right uh, palm uh, imagine there is a cavity uh, which is uh, square okay now Uh, and let us say that uh, on this uh, circular uh, cavity a trna which has got a uh, corresponding what is called a circular protrusion will come and sit now that very trna on the other end will carry an amino acid which has a square shape okay and for it to be able to do that uh, a square amino acid will be actually bound to the right hand arm okay so you can imagine now what is happening in your left arm you have a cavity which is circular on which a trna which has got a circular projection will come and bind on your right hand there is a square uh, if you can say depression on which will bind only a amino acid which has got a square shape okay and when the trna synthetase sees this trna come in we allow the square amino acid to be carried by the trna okay now another synthetase might have square on both side a triangle uh, uh, or one side a rectangle on the other side a square on both side so you see what is happening different trnas because they have different shapes are able to bind to different synthetases only and those synthetases are the correct active site which will carry the correct amino acid so that this coupling can occur okay uh, are, are you getting my point aditya okay yes sir uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, you know apne ko capsule banana hai na to ek hath mein we have to hold the receiving part of the capsule on the other side you have to hold uh, the you know the cap of the capsule only then you will be able to cap it okay so uh, imagine that you have different capsule making machines which actually recognize different shapes of what is called as the receiving part and the cap part so when different capsule machines work they'll only make one type of capsule only and only when the correct receiving part comes and the correct cap part comes that they'll be able to make that capsule okay so the 20 or 30 synthetases that we have in our body are all very different in their structure in the active site in that they specifically have high recognition for a given trna and they also have a high recognition for only one amino acid okay to give you an example uh, uh, some of these trna synthetases are so accurate that uh, uh, if you remember the amino acid valine and isoleucine remember what is the side chain in valine aditi in amino acid no, valine no i didn't 
साइड चेन इज आइसोप्रोपिल ग्रुप ओके सी एच एंड देन टू सी एस थ्री ग्रुप एंड इन लूसिन लूसिन साइड चेन अगर वन एक्स्ट्रा कार्बन ओके इट इज सी सी एस थ्री एंड देन सी एच टू सी एस थ्री ना दैट टी आर एन ए सिंथेटेज विच लोड्स अ टी आर एन ए विथ वेलिन its ability to recognize the trna which can potentially carry isoleucin or incorrectly load isoleucin that uh, uh, the difference is 200 fold so it has got a 200 fold higher affinity for the correct trna and valine as opposed to the other trna and leucin which means the active site is so beautifully designed that only certain trnas can come in bind and get loaded by a given amino acid in fact lot of people say that uh, this function of trna is even more complex than the actual uh, part where protein synthesis occurs from the ribosome because unless you load everything correctly the protein that you will make will always be lot of errors and if there are errors in the protein the protein will not be able to function okay i hope i answered your question yes sir sir just to so, get it uh, correct um the binding uh-huh. of the tr trna with the amino acid occurs during the reading or before it occurs like no no this is all the... no this is all before okay before the reading of uh-huh. the mrna it is connected uh-huh. and just when yeah, it all, mrna so, said it just yeah. comes and connects correct correct so the the loading of the trna is done uh, much before the actual protein synthesis will begin okay and when protein synthesis begins all the ribosome does is allow the correctly loaded trna to come in sit there based on the anticodon and the peptides get formed okay uh, there is no loading of amino acid on the trna is occurring in the ribosome that is done purely by synthetic okay and and the trna and amino acid are linked by the third uh, third hydroxy group hydroxy group on the third group so that is due to um, why can't it be on the second like uh, it could be, it could uh, yeah technically it could be on the second or the third it wouldn't matter the reaction would be the same okay but for some reason uh, it has been evolved uh, on the third but it could have been on the second and you would have seen the same reaction uh, possible uh, uh, or uh, which can occur on, on the third okay it is so easy. yeah it could have been on the second No, no. It is not that three OH is more stable or more reactive or nothing. Two OH oh, and three I OH. Just... Are... Sir, so, yes. can I speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just thought that on the first, on the first carbon there is an adenine group attached. So uh-huh. if the amino acid is attached on the second position, it may like create some steric hindrance. And the third position is relatively far as compared to the second one. So I just thought. maybe due to no, stability no, issues uh, not maybe really not. Uh, not really because if you th- think carefully you know the adenine is above the ring okay uh, and uh, the oh is actually below the ring okay if you look at the ribose both oh groups are below and adenine is above the ring you know it's a beta glycosidic bond so there is no issue of sterics okay? it, it is just uh, it is just reason Yeah, it is just evolved that way, I think, for some reason. But you could have put it on two; it would have worked the same way, according to me. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Any other question? Any other question? No. Okay. So can I stop so? recording for now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so this uh, so the modified like the amino acid loaded trna is and stored like you said it is occurring before the even the transcription starts uh, yeah, uh, occurring before translation starts like after Hello? the formation of the after the formation of the mrna uh, like but then how how it will like i i didn't get like after mrna is being read then only the trna will be formed right no no see trna formation is independent of mrna reading okay uh, because uh, trna present in active form or inactive form 
Uh, that has got nothing to do whether mRNA is being read or not. Okay, but if I want to efficiently make protein, uh, usually what happens in a cell is when uh, uh, mRNA production starts in the process of transcription, signals are sent uh, to uh, to load the tRNA. So what happens at that time is that cellular signals allow for tRNA synthesis to start loading all the different tRNAs with the correct amino acids. Okay, so those things are occurring. Uh, kind of in preparation for the fact that as soon as mRNA is there, I have to start making the protein. Okay, but uh, it has got nothing to do with actual synthesis of mRNA. It is only that usually what you want is mRNA synthesis and tRNA loading to occur kind of in sync so that uh, the process occurs quickly one after the other. Okay. Did I answer your question, Shivam? Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. Sir, I had a doubt. You said that yeah. um, before protein translation, everything is like getting connected, tRNA mm -hmm. and amino acid. So, isn't yeah. there a chance that yeah. before the protein gets formed, the amino acid may get attacked by some other molecules or it itself may attack someone else, which is not there in the sequence? Is there a chance? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what you are saying is a random the two different tRNAs come near each other and then uh, yeah. one of them amino group can attack the car. Yeah, that can probably occur in the background. But the propensity for that occurring uh, by chance is so low uh, that even if it occurs, uh, you might at the most make a dipeptide or a tripeptide, but there is no direction to that, right? When in the ribosome, there are specific spaces for them to bind, then you have a directed synthesis. So it occurs more efficiently, that's all. Okay, but yeah, uh, uh, we can also have this occurring at the background without the need of any ribosome, just by chance. Okay, and okay. because a carboxyl group is activated, you could form a hypertrophy. I'm pretty sure that occurs uh, to a small extent in the background. Okay, but you'll not get big peptides, and you'll get some random protein, a <laughs> random peptide. Okay. okay. Yeah, but that probably does happen, huh? You are very right that that can happen. Then it was just a thought. After all the work is done, we always talk uh, of this enzymes that they come in, they are made and all. After the work is done, how do they get degraded? Enzymes? Like, they, huh. Okay. Like, so after we finish our translation, no? towards the end we will be talking about post-translational modification. And when we talk about that, I'll tell you one type of modification uh, which uh, you know tags the protein for degradation. And degradation typically occurs in lysosomes. Okay, so we'll talk about that. So you'll have some idea of how when the job is done, they're systematically broken down to amino acids, and the amino acids are reused for synthesis of other proteins. Okay, so we'll talk about that when you okay. uh, towards the end of the translation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, can I stop the recording now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay.